Okay, everybody, welcome back to another Monday. And uh, this Monday, we're talking about process synchronization and chapter number six, which goes along with uh, homework assignment number three. Homework assignment number three is, cop is the CP command. I keep talking about it, but haven't really gone over the assignment yet. So the first assignment is the tiny shell. The second assignment, and the tiny shell I've gone over many times. Um, hopefully you're working on it. It's going to be the hardest of all of them. The second assignment is on CPU scheduling. I've covered that one already. We talked about CPU scheduling in the last couple weeks ago. Um, and that in, that in that particular assignment can be done in Java, C++, any language you want. So can this one. This one can be done in any language you want as well. Um, pr probably easier, I would say, to do it in C. But if you don't like C, then pick Java. Java is an easy language to work with as well. So what are we going to do for this assignment? It's called process synchronization. And uh, you're going to create a console-based application that spawns two threads, a producer and a consumer. So remember I talked about producer and consumer already. Um, one of the threads, as a producer-consumer model, the producer does something first, second, doesn't really matter what order. The consumer does something first, second, doesn't really matter what order. But they have to sort of synchronize their activities in terms of the order that they're executing things. Because if they don't, they, ought, they end up with corruption. As an example in here, you're going to use any programming language that you want. And you're going to create a producer that opens up an input file and repeatedly copies values to a circular buffer. So it's a circular buffer. It keeps going. It just, it's not fixed in size, it just keeps going. Circular means that item number one comes in, it's like a queue. Item number two goes in behind it, item number three goes in behind that, item number four goes in behind that. Someone pulls off, think of this more like a queue. Don't get stuck with the circular buffer kind of concept. Think of it like a queue. You put items in the back, and the consumer is going to pull items off of the front. Put items in the back, off of the front. So, and uh, you could implement this as a circular buffer, which means it just doesn't stop goes in a circle, cycles, input, output, input, output, input, output, until the cop entire file is copied. So the consumer, uh, so the producer copies into the buffer. The consumer opens up an output file and repeatedly copies the values from the same circular buffer to the file. Producer puts it in, consumer takes it out, puts it in, takes it out. Um, which is the producer consumer producer model. Uh, so for both of the producer and the consumers, a random number of bytes should be used between 1 and n, or any number uh, inclusive. Should, so it should be copied from each iteration. So instead of consumer, instead of producer, opening up the file, copying 5 bytes, putting it into the buffer, and then copying another 5 bytes, copying another 5 bytes, if he does a random amount, then you'll get the synchronization. If he's, if he's constantly doing 5, and the consumer comes in and pulls 5. And then producer puts five, and consumer puts five. You might as well just have one, one thread running, because it doesn't really make any sense. Um, so what we're going to have is essentially a situation in which if we have a <coughs> random number of bytes, the producer might put five in, or six, or whatever, some random between one and some, some max. Probably the max would be the size of the buffer, or how many bytes are left. Um, automatically populate the buffer. And then the consumer might come in and try to pull one or 10. If he tries to pull 10 out and there's only 5 in there, then you have to synchron up. There's nothing in there, so he should let go of that mutually exclusive resource and allow the producer to put more stuff in there. So the concept being, <coughs> you have a buffer, or let's just call it a piece of shared memory, and two threads are accessing it together. So, and they're synchronizing their access to it. So the buffer is the mutually exclu is the critical region, and the mutual exclusion is the producer and the consumer going to reading from or writing from this mutually exclusive kind of um, you know protected kind of storage area, which is what we're going to call the buffer. So for both for both of them, they should use a random number, and uh, should be copied for each one of the iterations. So it's not the same. So the producer doesn't produce five, consumer um, consumes five. And then the next round, he produces two, and the consumer produces, uh, consumes two or something. So you want to use different numbers for both of them. Makes it more interesting. And then the number of bytes should be random in each iteration. 
And so the bytes copied, bytes, the number of bytes we're working with. So if the producer is unable to write to the buffer <coughs> because it doesn't contain enough empty elements, uh, or if the consumer is unable to read from the buffer because it doesn't have enough items in there, then they should uh, proceed to the next iteration. And then choosing the new random number and copy new, co basically continue. So you have to detect the situation where there's nothing to read, nothing to write. Uh, which is the part of the assignment here. Uh, then, uh, so you proceed to the next one, and then and here's an exception. Once the producer has already read the entire file, he has nothing else, excuse me, he has already read into the buffer the entire file, there's nothing else to produce, so he stops. So then the consumer doesn't have to continue generating random numbers. Instead, it gets, uh, it gets everything. The consumer just finishes. So when the program completes, the output file should be an exact copy of the input file. You're writing a CP command. And the syntax for it, so in a regular Unix CP command, CP, but we're just going to say copy file. You can call it anything you want. This is the name of the file that you create, the name of the executable that you're creating. With the input file, the output file, and then N and M. Well, N is the maximum number of bytes to copy in any given iteration which is what size of your buffer or the size of something just create a maximum actually m is the size of the circular buffer so you don't want to use that so you want to say bet something between a maximum number and here's the full amount of the buffer because we have to keep track of how big the buffer is because if we don't know how big the buffer is then uh, we can't um, essentially um, you know control how, what we're going to read and write to it so let's say you have the buffer that is of any size you want to make it, let's say 50, 50 bytes. And then the maximum any one of the producers or consumers can work with, let's say 10 or 15 or 20. Then if you make it 25, it's just two shots. You know, 25, 25 is 50. <laughs> well, actually that works because you're going to have more than 50 bytes in your file. And this will actually work. You can actually create this one, not like the CPU scheduler where you're writing a demonstration. This actually will copy a file. Or should copy a file. And if you're off by one byte or something at the end, then you're going to end up in a situation where the file is not an exact copy. <laughs> so the best way to do this is actually take an executable file, copy it from one location to the other, and see if you can run the file. If you can, you know it's complete. So, or check the bytes in each one of them. So copy file is the name of the executable, input is the name of the input file, output is the name of the output file, n is the maximum number of bytes to copy. And M is the size of the circular buffer. And that is all that you need to do for this assignment. The assignment's not due till the last day of class, which is August 22nd. But you don't want to wait till the last day of class or the day before the last day of class to do all this stuff. This one is going to take you a little bit of time, only because then you have to start thinking about process synchronization and the producer-consumer model. If you have a copy of the textbook, in the textbook there's a producer-consumer example. You can use the example. Um, you can use the example to put it together, the model. You have to ch switch it around so that you're actually reading a file, writing a file, um, and then using a circular buffer. So, Questions about assignment number three? No? Okay. We're, we feel like, I feel like we're almost halfway through the course already because it, it turned into July overnight. So, uh, so I want to take a brief moment to kind of revisit the schedule momentarily here. while we're doing house cleaning and stuff in the beginning. Uh, <coughs> we have a CSLO essay, which I was told we've gone over already, but I'll just, oh, no, I don't think we have. So programming assignments, 50%, final exam, 25%, and the CSLO essay. So the CSLO essay happened to have right here. Let me take a look at this, too. The CSLO essay is sort of like the midterm for this course. Uh, there is no midterm. We just have a final exam. Uh, and we have those five assignments, but let's take a look at the at the uh, CSLO essay momentarily, and let's make it a little bit bigger so you can see it as well. You're going to write a two to three page double space essay of a topic of your choice, and uh, you must provide your own writing. And again, it doesn't have to be your own handwriting; it can be typing. Like, seriously, I had like thirty or forty people ask me the same question. 
You don't have to use your own hand. It's not handwriting. It's not right. It typing or whatever. However, it has to be your own words. Okay. And it cannot contain portions of cut and paste information from the internet. Turnitin.com is, uh, from what I've gathered, is implemented. Um, I don't know if it's live yet, but it's definitely, they have it, they've been working on it. So and one of these days, it's actually going to be part of the integration of the EMS. And when it is, you're going to want to be, be careful of that. Uh, because it will pick up plagiarism faster than the teachers will. So um, what are you going to do? You're going to pick one of these topics. The two to three pages is double spaced, which means uh, it's like one or two pages, cut it in half for double spacing. Uh, so select one of these topics. So it's not a bad idea to tar start looking at the topics because it's topics that we've been covering in the lecture. So don't copy out of the book either. So not the book, not the internet. Just pull out a blank notepad or a blank word pad or Microsoft Word file and start typing your answers. You know, like the good old days of writing something yourself. So what's an operating system? That's a loaded question. Um, so you could focus on the concept of the overall operating systems, uh, what functions it provides, <clears throat> an overview of the history, the evolution. That's really chapters number one and two, actually, if you have the book there. Chapter number two is, uh, no, no, chapter number one. It's really just chapter number one. Chapter number two is not um, going to help you with this. Uh, but writing on definitions and stuff like that, discussing hardware platforms and operating systems, uh, and keeping in track, uh, also discussing that the desktop PC operating system and how it was evolved and stuff like that. So that's a trip down memory lane if you're interested in doing that one. Or you can go to option number two, <coughs> which is the kernel, and uh, talk about the concept of the kernel. You could actually get into user mode, kernel mode, and the dual mode processing systems if you wanted to with this one. And uh, what's the difference between the kernel mode and the user mode? Providing an overview of the features and uh, utilities that kernels provide and stuff like that. Or, item number three, what's a process? We just went over those, actually. Uh, that's chapter number three. And what's a thread? Uh, chapter number three, two and three. Uh, describing how the process and threads are used in operating systems. We know a process is a program that runs out there, and a thread is a thread of execution. They're really the same thing, but one, we're talking about kernel language. The other one, we're talking about user mode language. So processes are implemented in the form of threads for the most part. Um, but there are sometimes some textbooks call them the same thing. Some people just call them threads and not processes. Um, it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction of how we're going to get these programs to run on a computer. So you could talk about threads and processes if you wanted to. Or you can describe operating systems memory. We haven't gotten into memory yet, but that's a topic coming up. And you might find that to be interesting. Um, or you could talk about CPU scheduling, which we just covered last week, um, and how it's performed. So you're thinking, well, I'm writing an assignment on CPU scheduling. So after you do all your work with the CPU scheduler that you're going to write in assignment number two, you could easily pop out the CSLO essay for number five, actually, here, describing the concept of CPU scheduling. And you can actually use your assignment number two as a basis for writing the essay. You know, say, in my assignment, I did this, and I did just elaborate for two or three pages about your assignment if you wanted to. Uh, that works as well, because then I know you really wrote it in your own words, <laughs> because you're talking about the assignment you turned in and how you designed the CPU scheduler and how, because it is open because if you look at um, option number eight, write on an operating system topic of your choice. Pick any topic that was covered in class or provide an overview of it, and provide an overview of it. Well, if I were writing this essay and I just went through the elaborate CPU scheduler stuff, I could do that. I could just spend the entire essay talking about issues associated with my CPU scheduler. It's a topic of your choice, and it's also on the topic of the class, and it's on topic of the CPU scheduler. Or you could be more generic and just talk about CPU scheduling. You can also do the same thing and answer these questions. What, what, is, what components are included in it, and uh, what are some of the ways to optimize it, stuff like that. So some students have asked me before in the past, well, number five, I'm just using number five as an example here. It has a one, two, three, four, five, six questions in it. Do we have to answer all questions? No, because you go to number eight here. <laughs> number eight 
gets rid of all the questions entirely here because number eight says right on topic of your choice. <laughs> you don't like all f six questions, don't answer all six questions. Then you're doing number eight. You don't have to tell me which option you're doing either. I want you to write two or three pages on a topic of your choice. <laughs> you have perfect freedom. Discuss something about operating systems. So, um, The other thing you can do also is uh, the one up here on processes and threads. It talks about um, functionality. So you could actually use your CP copy file um, assignment as a basis to writing this one too. So it has some students who do that, which is why I'm mentioning it. They'll pick an assignment that they've done and write about it and use the operating system concepts. Because each one of the assignments has a learning objective that's associated with the content for the course. So if it's on processes and threads or if it's on scheduling or whatever, you know, the theme itself lends, its, lends itself quite well to an essay, actually, uh, because it's, it'll fall into one of these categories. Um, later on, of course, we'll also be talking about protection and security. We haven't co covered that topic yet, but you can write on that, or distributed operating systems, or any type mobile operating systems. Um, you can talk about the differences between mobile and desktop operating systems, or you can actually do a comparison of mobile operating systems. Compare iOS with Android with uh, Blackberry devices or Windows Phone or that might make for an interesting topic as well. Uh, make sure it is on the concept of operating systems and operating systems functionality. It's worth 25% of your grade so it's a pretty significant amount of points so you don't want to you don't want to get zero on this one. Um, and then it's also doing the last day of class as well. And it's around the midterm time, so it's about the time that you want. If you're thinking about it, we're about halfway. We're, we're approaching almost the halfway point if we're not there yet. So it's kind of like uh, you want to have something to talk about in terms of your essay, in terms of the concepts we've covered. And you now it's a good time to present this one, so I did that. So. Questions on the CSLO essay. What color ink do you have to use <laughs> when you handwrite it yourself? I'm sorry, the, the people that made that comment originally aren't in this class because it's from a previous section. I swear one section, actually two sections of this course when I, I did, I always use the same writing. I swear they wanted to know it, it had to be handwritten. It was just ridiculous. <clears throat> All right, so the topic of today, in fact, here, let me uh, break this out. I'm going to stop this video here.